My name is Bianca Simon, and I'm here today with Rachel Gibbons to discuss the work of Jean-Michel Basquiat. So Jean-Michel started his early career off as a graffiti artist who went by the name of Samo. He actually had an unstable early life, and he ran away from home, and when he was 17, he eventually ended up living on his own. Through his running away, it's difficult to gauge exactly the impact of his parents' relationship. Um, through this portrait of his mother, known as Mater, uh, you can see um, growing up his mother was in a lot of psychiatric wards. You can see uh, the struggle, the lots of harsh lines. You can see her hands up against the walls almost as if she's trying to get out, like she's trapped. Uh, and through his father's portrait especially, and his mother's portrait, you can see like a halo around their heads holding them at a high esteem. His father's portrait particularly though, you can see an emphasis on his genitalia, uh, symbolizing an emphasis on the masculinity uh, that he may have been searching for in his father. And you can also definitely see how his mother being Puerto Rican and his father being Haitian really impacted his artwork through color schemes, through um, the subject matter, etc. Yes, and in these next images, you can see his heavy use of text. He really loves using text to portray his ideas and getting them across to people. And he takes this in a very interesting way, and I just think that he does a great job at it. Yes, he plays into the words almost using reverse psychology, attracting the viewer to what he wants him, them to see uh, versus what the viewer might see offhand. So he also needed to make money while he was bumming out on the streets, so he decided to start making postcards, and this is what he did. He also made t-shirts and things like that. So one day he went into a restaurant and he saw Andy Warhol sitting with a few of his friends and he went up to them, handed them some postcards and they said, wow, this guy is great. So then this really started this relationship with Andy Warhol mm -hmm. and his friends. It was great. Uh, and later on in life, he ended up working with Andy Warhol uh, to create a number of pieces. This piece in particular, you can see both of their influences. Um, in talking about their collaborations, uh, Jean-Michel has been, said that uh, Andy would contribute an icon, and then he would go in and deface the work, uh, and they yeah. would have this back and forth between the two of them. Yeah, so there's a lot of conversation going on between them about what would work, what wouldn't work, how am I going to take this to another level. Uh, also, the passing of Andy Warhol did impact him greatly, uh, even to the extent of making a piece uh, dedicated to his passing. Yeah, and it says perishable, which is interesting because Andy Warhol has pieces of his pop art, like with the tomato soup, about, and that sort of commentary on Andy Warhol's work and how it affected him. He's very successful in creating um, a nice balance between spontaneity and control while still referencing classical artists such as da Vinci, uh, referencing Van Gogh, referencing pieces like Guernica from Picasso, really taking uh, synthetic cubism to a new level, integrating neo-expressionism uh, in his own primitive twist, making it his own, making it new, making it uh, fresh. Yeah, so he just took on almost a child's perspective of these basic ideas that are foreseen in these pieces, and it's really actually quite interesting. Even more so interesting is perspective of him as a black figure in a predominantly white community, um, even being torn down uh, and turned away from the MoMA and Whitney and his uh, really experimental work at the time, uh, and really using his work as a medium uh, to comment on the social stigmas against him as well as the black community. So he uses this piece here, The Irony of a Black Police Officer, and it's really, it's really interesting how he just portrays the black man. He does it by not his own view, but by the view of society and how they feel about what the black man looks like and how they don't respect him as a policeman. Even going back to colonial times, he makes peace referencing, making pieces referencing uh, the slave trade, um, really bringing up, uh, I guess, uh, the history of uh, blacks in America. Yeah. Uh, but even more so to the ends of his life, he really started to get paranoid as to who and who wasn't his friend. Uh, as you can see through this piece, um, XU, um, you can see all the eyes and things referencing uh, possibly paranoia. Uh, and this is also when he really started to get into heavy drug use, uh, especially the use of heroin. Um, yeah. And really his work started to kind of reference that he even felt as though he was reaching some kind of an end point yeah, in his you life. You can see such a huge transition and subject matter and how much more dark it gets. So we get to this final piece, this final image 
called Riding with Death. Yeah, and we also equate this one to The Night, Death, and the Devil engraving, engraving by Durer. And you can see just the simplicity, but so much emotion went into this creation and how like we're seeing when we're about to die or things like that. It's just so dark. And, you know, we're on our way to death, you know, and it's scary. And it's really interesting also uh, that you brought up in referencing the Jura print um, that he, he he's simplifying the image so much, but he's not losing the symbolism behind yeah. uh, what Dura tried to achieve in his engraving, um, really referencing... Um, you know, the debacle between life and death, referencing God. Um, and I think in referencing these pieces, he's really building upon the messages that these artists of their time were trying to express. Yeah, and you can definitely see how he was feeling, how he was foretelling the future that His eventually, own future. yeah, eventually we're all going to die, but specifically he's going to die. Mm -hmm. And how eerie that is to see really um, come together.